Okay, so um, the real focus of today's lecture is going to be continuing uh, the transient conduction. And we're going to be taking this thing we talked about last time, right, which was um, we termed lumped capacitance. And so this is lecture 17, which is on generalized lumped capacitance. So we're going to start... Um, looking at ways that we can kind of leverage this simplifying assumption we made uh, previously to solve more problems than just right some objects um, cooling down. So to kind of recap where we were last time, um, right, we defined transient conduction as transfer involving both time and space as uh, variables of interest. Um, and so one of the first key variables we said that you should, or one of the first key parameters we said you should calculate when you encounter a transient problem, right, something where Maybe the object goes through some step change in the environment. Maybe you start apply some, applying some heat to it. Um, or perhaps um, uh, some chemical reaction begins in the interior of some object. Right? Something that causes its conditions to shift from equilibrium. Uh, the first thing that you should do when you encounter one of these is to calculate this key uh, parameter that we called the BO number which is defined as bi equals h times lc over k, where lc is defined as our, or is equal to the volume of the object over its surface area, and we know as the characteristic length. Right, so if if uh, the object we're considering is like a planar wall, the idea is if we figure out the volume of that wall and divide by the surface area, what we should get is the thickness of that wall. Um, so it's some representation of kind of the the um, the mean length of, of some object. If it's irregularly sized, as I said before, LC is representative of if you took that object of irregular size and you squished it into a cube. LC would be the length of one side of that cube. So it gives you a general idea of how big something is you know, in terms of linear dimensions. Um, and as a rule, we said that if BI is less than about 0 0.1, we can use this magical thing called lumped capacitance analysis, uh, where the key to thing about lump capacitance analysis is that we assume that T of a body is uniform. And so we give it the term, the, the, the variable name T sub B. Okay. So as an object is heating up or cooling down, we say that it has the same temperature throughout that object and that that temperature is, as a whole, increasing or decreasing as thermal energy is added to or lost from that object. Right? So the way we went about solving this was by establishing that we can't use the heat equation because we've gotten rid of the whole temperature gradient thing that drives Fourier's law. So we went back a step and we said first law, conservation of energy, energy balance. We're going to go ahead and write E dot stored is equal to right, E dot in minus E dot out plus E dot G. Last time I wrote this in terms of total energy, this time I'll do it in terms of thermal plus mechanical, which just means, remember, that we include this energy generation term. Um, 
as a rule, like previously, we said, all right, you put something in, you take some object, solid object, say a piece of metal, you heat it up, and you put it into some state where it's cooling down by convection. In that case, we said, all right, there's no heat generation going on, there's no heat being added, and we can approximate the rate of change of thermal energy as rho C V dt dt equal to heat out would be negative h surface area tb oh sorry, this would be tb minus t infinity so this represents the rate of change of stored energy in our object and this represents Q due to convection. So the nice thing about this is it's now a first order differential equation, which we can solve by the method of separation. Um, I won't go through the solution again, but what we ended up with was two versions of the solution. The first says, oops, we'll call it form one. So T is equal to rho v c over h times the surface area of the object times the natural log of the difference between the initial temperature and the, uh, the, the, the surrounding fluid temperature and the difference between the current temperature and the surrounding fluid temperature. So that's version one which is the time to, or time for object to heat or cool from Ti to some temperature T sub B. And the second version of the solution is T sub B is equal to Ti minus T infinity raised to, or times the exponent of negative H S over rho C V, let me make that rho better, times T plus T infinity. And this alternatively gives us the temperature TB after cooling or heating from TI for time T. So two useful ways of using this, right? These should kind of correspond to the two things we might be interested in transient conduction. Like I said before, if I put my coffee on the table here and I forget about it, what's the temperature going to be an hour later when I finally remember? All right, or, so that would be this guy, or, as in the case before, say you're going through some metal working process and you want to know how long is it going to take uh, something to heat up to its crystallization temperature if I'm annealing metal. Okay, if you know the beginning temperature, T infinity, and the crystallization temperature of that metal, you can use the first to figure out approximately how long it'll take. So, a couple of things to note here. Um, or, well, really just one thing to note. Um, so, this second one right here, right, if we plotted T sub B as a function of T, and we sort of got to this last time, but we didn't really um, drive it home, we end up with this thing we call the cooling curve. We have time, and up here we have TB. Let's say we uh, place this object into thing where this, say this is the fluid temperature here, and it begins at some much higher temperature up here. The cooling curve for this object is going to look like, and we can see this from the E raised to the negative power, is going to be this exponential decay. 
And one of the features of exponential decay, right, is that out here we end up with an asymptotic approach to t infinity, which leads to some problems. I mean, uh, asymptotic approaches are never really that much fun. Yes? Are you missing a negative in the first form? Uh, no, actually. It's slightly different than before. Um, before we had a negative, and our the terms in our ln were flipped, right? And so remember that you know if you're doing natural logs, a negative of natural log is equal to natural log of one over whatever that argument was before. So the version before did have a negative. Um, I've just simplified it here. They're equivalent. Um, Anyway, so uh, the right so the asymptotic approaches are a little bit of a mess because, and we'll show this in an example. Um, a typical question might be: All right, I've got some hot piece of metal. I set it into a, I put it into a bucket of of water to quench it. How long does it take to reach the temperature of the water? The mathematical answer is never. Right, it's never actually going to reach temperature t infinity. Um, just kind of a pain, uh, but I'll show you um, an example we'll talk about. You can usually define something pretty consistently that says it's close enough, right? If it gets 99% of the way, for example. So um, to kind of finish up this recap, let's go ahead and do another example. Um, this one is uh, similar to, uh, there was a problem on homework one that involved like, the transient cooling of a block of wood. Um, I tried doing that example. It turns out the folks that wrote that FE question didn't bother to make sure lumped capacitance is actually valid. The BO number comes out to be something like five. So it's actually not a good way to analyze that problem. Thanks, FE. Um, so we're going to change it a little bit and we're going to say um, what we have is some rectangular block of rather than wood it's going to be tungsten right so it's a metal um, which has a conductivity of 30.7 watts per meter square or watts per meter Kelvin um, a heat capacity of 489 joules per kilogram Kelvin and a density of 6,100 kilograms per meter cubed. Uh, we're going to say that this thing has dimensions of 12 centimeters wide by 14 centimeters long by 10 centimeters high. <clears throat> so let's say this thing um, starts out at a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. And let's say it's placed into ambient air at a fluid temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. Um, and it takes six hours for uh, the temperature at the boundary to approach, or the temperature of the body to approach the ambient air temperature. So this is an example of what I was saying before. We're saying, okay, it takes about six hours for it to register the same temperature on the body as the air. Um, and so what we're tasked with is find the convective cooling or the convect, uh, convective, convective cooling coefficient H. So, like I said before, this this is what's going to present us the first problem, okay? Or or one of two problems. Um, so we'll say there are two issues we see here. Issue number one, TB 
will never actually each reach uh, t infinity. So we're going to have to pick some point that we say is close enough. All right. I'm going to propose that 99% of the way from t, t i to t infinity means that we are substantially in thermal equilibrium. That is, um, we'll we'll go ahead and state that thermal equilibrium is reached when Tb minus T infinity is equal to 0 0.01 times Ti minus T infinity. So that temperature difference has shrunk by 99%. This, in turn, gives us this nice expression, which will come in useful later, right, that Tb minus T infinity over Ti minus T infinity is equal to 0 0.01 or the reciprocal Ti minus T infinity over Tb minus T infinity is equal to 100. Yeah. So we're just establishing the limits on the temperature. <laughs> Issue number two. We don't know that lumped capacitance is actually valid yet. Right, so ordinarily what we would propose to do is check the BO number. So is LC valid? We would say is the BO number less than approximately 0 0.1? The problem with that is, right, that the BO number is equal to H times LC over K and we don't know H, right? That's what we're trying to solve in the problem. So this is an example where we don't, before we solve the problem, we don't know whether our solution is gonna be valid. So we're gonna to have to go ahead, find a candidate value of H, and then go back and check to make sure that the way we did it from the start was actually correct, right? It's kind of a two-stage um, solution. All right, so we're going to go ahead and come up here to right this. Let me go ahead and pick a different color. Um, this version of our uh, solution, right? Because we know T. Um, we know everything. The idea is what we're, we know everything in here except for H. So we're just going to be plugging in values and solving for H. So we have T equal to rho V C over H A S times L N of T I minus T infinity over T B minus T infinity. So we can solve for H as being equal to rho V C over A S one over T times that same natural log. So plugging in the numbers we have, right, for rho, for the, well, I should calculate the volume. We said that the volume um, is going to be equal to our length times width times height, so 0 0.1 meters times 0 0.12 meters times 0 0.14 meters works out to 0 0.00168 meters cubed. And the surface area will be equal to 2 times right L by B plus um, L by W plus W by B, 0 0.086 meters squared. So now we know everything that goes into this equation on the right-hand side. So this is going to be H equal to 6,100 kilograms per meter cubed times 0 0.00168 meters cubed times 489 joules per kilogram K. 
Kelvin, right, rho Vc, divided by 0 0.086 meters squared times 1 over T here, right? We said 6 hours. That means 360 minutes, which works out to 21,000. Um, is that right? 21,400 seconds. I have it written down somewhere. I think, yes, 21,600. 21, sorry. 21,600 seconds times the natural log of, and here's where that choosing how, what percentage of the cooling has completed comes in handy because we said here's our initial temperature difference, here's our ending temperature difference. We said the ending temperature difference will only be 1% of how, how big the difference is initially. So this turns out to be ln of 100. So plugging all of this in, we're going to end up with a solution for H of 12.48 watts per meter squared Kelvin, which is a very reasonable number. All right, All right. Cooling in air, um, especially in still air, tends to be somewhere in the 10 range, you know, 10 to 20. So um, very reasonable. Now we have H. We can go back and check the BO number to make sure that we didn't just come up with a garbage solution, right? So it's conceivable that, for example, if H were really large, that is, if the convective cooling were really important to the problem, we could go back, calculate the BO number, find that the BO number is larger than 0 0.1, and have to scrap the entire solution. Um, I promise that's not the case here, but um, so to check the BO number, the last thing we need to find is, right, we say the, the characteristic length volume over the surface area, and this works out to be value of 0 0.02 meters. And where did we go? Okay. So BO number H times LC over K works out to 12 point watts per meter squared Kelvin times 0 0.02 meters divided by 30.7 watts per meter Kelvin. We can see by inspection, right, that the meters here and the meter squared and the denominator here cancel and the watts per meter Kelvin, watts per meter Kelvin cancel. So we'll end up with a dimensionless number of 0 0.008, which passes our test for being smaller than 0 0.1. So we solved the solution tentatively. We went back. We used our solution to, to validate the analysis we used. Um, and if you think about it, right, the process there is actually kind of a neat trick. Using something that just has known properties, measuring its temperature at one point, measuring the temperature at some later point, and using that to back out the convective coefficient. Right? It could be a useful, an actual useful approach to indirectly measuring heat transfer uh, thermodynamic properties. So, <clears throat> it bears mentioning that. Right, in our um, sort of our second version of the solution, right? So we had the first that was in terms of time, um, and the second, which was in terms of temperature after some period of time. So Tb equals Ti minus T infinity e to the negative Has over rho C V times T plus T infinity, right? So if we, if we work with this lump capacitance analysis, we find that after a while we keep encountering this term right here, this H times surface area over the product of density, specific heat capacity, and volume. Um, I'm going to make that a little larger. Um, so I want to pick apart that group of terms a little bit, and we'll, we'll We'll use this a little more later when we talk about scaling, but um, 
h. There we go. A s over row c v. Um, I want you to remember that right v over surface area is um, defined as the characteristic length. So this works out to be one over l c. Uh, so we can rewrite this as h over row c l c. Oh, come on. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, multiply both the numerator and the denominator by the quantity lc times k. And what that gets us is hlc over k times k over rho c times t, oh sorry, I should have a t in here, um, times t over lc squared. We've got some important groups of terms here. This one should be familiar, right? This is our BO number. The second term we have mentioned before but haven't really used extensively. This is known as alpha or the diffusivity of an object. It tells you how important the diffusion, the heat diffusion or conduction within a body is. And then this last term, um, when multiplied by alpha, is known as the Fourier number or FO. So we have BI, which is our BO number. Alpha is known as a measure of thermal diffusivity. And FO is a Fourier number. So the BO number tells you the ratio of importance of oops, wrong way. Convection relative to conduction. The thermal diffusivity gives you the importance of conduction relative to the amount of stored energy. And the Fourier number is a dimensionless measure of time. All right, why this is, this is a major departure from what we were just talking about, right? Now we're abstracting out these, these, these kind of bizarre terms. Um, I want you to right, steal yourselves and rewind back to your fluids class uh, to when we talked about scaling, right, and dimensional analysis. Um, remember that one of the key things that was useful about dimensional analysis was it looked, allowed us to take a big group of variables and boil it down to a smaller group of dimensionless variables that could describe a problem of any type. Here we've taken, oops, we've taken a quantity that involves one, two, three, four, five, six dimensional variables, right? And we've boiled it down to something that only has half as many dimensionless ones. So we are now able to basically describe the entire um, cooling curve, if you will, based on just these three numbers. So we could write Tb minus T infinity over Ti minus T infinity is equal to E raised to the negative BO number times Fourier number. As I said, the reason this is useful is because um, if you're talking about something that is, uh, you know, you're talking about a, a, a steel sphere like, we're, like we did last class, and you want to compute the cooling curve for that. Um, but all you have to sort of approximate that is a sphere made out of copper. Okay, then you can tweak the rest of. You could tweak the size of that copper sphere. You could tweak the uh, uh, the convective coefficient by increasing the rate of airflow past it. 
etc. And you can increase, and you can measure how long it takes for it to cool down, and then non-dimensionalize your results into a cooling curve that looks like this. And then you could plug in the results for your steel sphere and recover the one that you're interested in. So it's a way of doing modeling, basically. We'll get into this more later, but I wanted to point out that this um, cooling curve lends itself to a non-dimensional description, which makes it useful for generalization to problems that we don't want to analyze directly. So, uh, and we'll probably have to continue this later, but I want to um, discuss quickly Oh, come on. Lumped capacitance with other heat transfer mechanisms. Uh, so, <clears throat> suppose we take some hot piece of metal. I know this is our, our kind of, we keep falling back on this example. It's a good one. Um, we take some hot chunk of metal, fresh out of the, uh, the forge, and we place it into a cooling chamber. Okay. Um, how, in general, is cooling going to occur? Well, we covered before. There's going to be convective cooling to the air surrounding. So let's assume that there's some sort of natural airflow around the object, which... Um, is going to cause some heat transfer by convection. Oh my gosh. It's going to cause some heat transfer by convection to the surrounding air. But what if this cooling chamber right, surrounding the object is, um, we'll go ahead and say that it's right, this very large surrounding space. Remember in chapter one, we talked about radiation as being another important uh, factor in heat transfer. So besides convection, there's also going to be this radiation in the form of emission or emi uh, emitted power away from the object and incident power or in irradiation coming in from the boundaries here. So we have cooling or heating, I should say, mechanisms at play include convection, radiation, which involves both um, emission and irradiation, where emission is out irradiation is in. Okay. Um, additionally, we might have something going on inside of this object. Let's say, uh, let's say rather than just being a um, a hot metal ball, let's say that this is some um, sphere that is a, a shell that's full of some nuclear fuel. Okay. You might have additionally some rate of heat generation inside of the sphere. Uh, so we also have as a possible um, mechanism thermal energy generation. The question is, can we use lumped capacitance to deal with this, and if so, how? Right. Um, turns out the answer is yes, and it's quite quite elegant how we do it and it ends up being um, really quite simple okay so we would do we'd start out by again writing our energy balance so stored energy is equal to in this case Q convection plus Q radiation plus E G right so um, notice that in this case we have signed these so that uh, Q convection would be signs convective heating, radiation would be radiative heating, and this would be something positive. So um, we're going to have to put negative signs in front of these to account that for the fact that uh, thermal energy is actually flowing out. So writing out, you know, using our rate equations that we established before, 
Um, we could go ahead and write rho c v d t d t is equal to negative h a s t b minus t infinity minus here's the Stefan Boltzmann law b to the fourth minus t um, sorry surroundings to the fourth power plus q dot times volume. Understand we have now, right, here's our rate of change of stored energy, here's our Q due to convection, here's Q due to radiation, and here is E dot G. And this is all stuff we did in chapter one. Um, we are just now actually getting around to trying to solve for t um, as a function of time. Question is, do we know how to solve this exactly? We do not. The reason why is because we have, right, first order differential equation. That's fine, but it's not linear. We have a TV raised to the fourth power there, which just throws a wrench into things in general. We hate nonlinear differential equations. So rather than solving this by hand, Numerical methods are again the way we're going to go. And I know you guys are sick of numerical methods because the heat equation on a two-dimensional domain is a pain. Um, so this one's a lot simpler, I promise you. Uh, this is going to be something we call a time marching scheme. Numerical method is our easiest approach. take advantage of what we call time marching. So um, we only have one derivative, right? That's our dt, or our, our differential uh, temperature is a function of time. I should put a b here. Um, and we can use, remember those of you who have, I guess you've probably all, almost all taken um, your numerical methods class by now, but it's, um, we call a forward Euler approximation, which basically says it's approximately equal to T B N plus one minus T B N over delta T, where I want to mention that um, T B N plus one is the temperature at time n plus 1. Uh, I just put it as a subscript because we already have a b in this. Uh, I put it as a superscript because we already have a b in the subscript. Um, Tbn is going to be at T sub n. And T n plus 1 is just equal to T sub n plus delta T. In other words, saying we can turn our time into a series of discrete steps um, and count up in ordering ends. Um, so if you think about it, this really, right, this looks kind of like a, um, uh, the classic uh, quotient from, uh, from which you derive the idea of a differential when you're first learning calculus. Um, but if we plug this in, right, to our equation above, we end up with Tb n plus 1 minus Tb n over delta T times rho Cv is equal to negative H as Tb n minus T infinity n minus epsilon sigma sub s b n to the fourth minus t surroundings n to the fourth plus q dot n b. So by putting an n in the superscript of everything, we're simply saying at some instant in time, if we know the temperature of the body, of the surroundings, of the air, and we know the rate of heat generation at some time instant n, right? 
then we can basically approximate what the rate of change of the temperature will be at that point. And what we're going to do is solve for the temperature at the next step. So we're going to say we know the conditions now. We know the slope. We're going to extrapolate out one time step. So we say T B N plus 1 is equal to negative H S T B N minus T infinity N minus epsilon sigma S T B N to the fourth minus T B N to the fourth, oh sorry, surroundings plus Q dot N times volume, all times delta T over rho C V plus T B N. Previous temperature, slope of the temperature, and some amount of time through which you're projecting that slope. So it's an extrapolation, one step at a time. And you can actually solve this very easily in Excel. Right? It's not something that's going to require you to break out MATLAB. And I have an Excel problem that we don't have time to get through. What I'll do is I'll fill out the sheet, um, and I will put it up on, uh, on Icon so that you can see the way that you'd set a problem and solve it in Excel. It's tied to one of the examples in the book. Um, so I've made a request for uh, a classroom space to hold Monday's review session. Um, I've requested a room somewhere in Siemens Center. We'll see where it ends up being uh, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Monday. I will confirm once I hear back about from the room scheduling folks that that's done. Uh, and I will post solutions to the practice midterm probably tomorrow. So you can take a look at those and bring any questions that come up to the review session for Q&A.